Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. Before we get started with today's wonderful webinar, I have a few housekeeping items that I would like to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded. So if you miss any or all of the event, please know that you'll be able to access the webinar on demand. Following the, the webinar today, you will receive a link in email that will take you right to the, the webinar on demand. It will also be on the devops.com website. Also, we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation you have a question, just use your control panel there, submit your question. We'll take about 10 or 15 minutes near the end of the presentation to go over the audience questions. Okay, today's webinar, Integrated Agile and DevOps, DevOps 2.0 and beyond. I'm the moderator for today's event, Charlene O'Hanlon, and I would like to introduce our speaker for today, who is Logan Daigle. He's DevOps strategist and Agile coach at CollabNet. Welcome, Logan. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Charlene. Glad to be here to share. Great, great. Well, I'm just going to turn things right over to you and let you do your thing. Very good. Thank you. All right. So <clears throat> just a little bit about myself here. Um, um, again, Logan Daigle here. Um, Today is really a great day for trying to explain um, where we think the next steps of DevOps are going to go and why it's so important that um, Agile and DevOps are, are unified. Um, <clears throat> um, and you're welcome to follow me on Twitter at any time at the DevOps Guru. So I will begin. So when we're talking about moving from DevOps to DevOps 2.0, we really have to have a clear understanding of both of the definitions. And I know that the definition of DevOps is very well stated. Um, and so I'm going to jump to the next slide in just a second to show you um, the, the, I think, the probably the most accepted definition, and it's the one by Gene Kim in his handbook, uh, the DevOps handbook. But when we talk about what's really trying to happen from the shift of DevOps to DevOps 2.0, I think that there has to be a very clear uh, problem statement. Um, I think I've, I've done a lot of work with our customers over the last 18 months, and what we see is that DevOps has, uh, gives organizations a very big opportunity to do something really great. But much like the picture that you're seeing, um, when you get when you open the the DevOps machine or the DevOps box and try to figure out what's best for your organization, you're looking at what could be the inside of a clock. And the only person that really understands how to work on that clock is the clock maker. Um, and where I think we're going from DevOps to DevOps 2.0 is to really try to open the box and make it such make it a system in which more people other than just the technologists that understand the DevOps machine can understand DevOps and help to utilize it and help to push it forward in their organizations. So what is DevOps? If you crack open the, Gene, the DevOps handbook and look to see what, um, what Gene Kim has to say, he's going to tell you that this is the emerging professional movement that advocates the collaborative working relationship between development and IT operations, resulting in the fast flow of planned work, i.e. high deploy rates, while simultaneously increasing the reliability, stability, resilience, and security of the production environment. And this is a really great definition. I think it really encapsulates where we've come over the last five or six years in trying to make and help development teams work better with IT operations teams such that we're trying to make sure that we have a unified goal so that the change part of the organization and the development team is able to push their changes through a delivery pipeline much faster and with the help of the teams in the operations group who are trying to make sure that we have 100% uptime or as close to it as we can get. Now, I have to define what DevOps 2.0 is. And it's really a very simple approach, um, but it's very elegant as well. And so it's not 
it's a simple uh, definition, but it's a very uh, elegant and com sometimes complicated way to try to, to try to look at what do we do next with DevOps. And so what I ask is when, when you ask what DevOps 2.0 is, maybe you, you joined and you're like, I want to understand what that really means. I think that it's really trying to take the, the, the idea and the breadth of what the DevOps thought leaders are trying, were trying to do or are trying to do and, you know, and make sure that we go back to their key points when they started and trying to understand that improving the process, just like Agile tried to improve our development processes and DevOps is trying to improve our, dev our development processes, we're really trying to take a more holistic view on everything that we're doing. And so when we talk about how we apply DevOps 2.0 to DevOps, I really just believe that it's bringing that focus back to what we what we call DevOps. It's really focusing on the entire value stream. How do we know what we're doing from concept to cache? Measuring it, being able to know that we're improving, knowing where bottlenecks are, being able to utilize constraints to the best of their ability or even try to remove them if that's possible. We really come down to not just talking about dev and ops, we start to talk about what does the business want? What do our customers want? And we really focus on how all of the inputs of business, customer, development, operations, testing come together to build, help us build our software. And <clears throat> um, it, like I said, it's a very elegant thing to talk about. And with our customers, it, it's been uh, an eye-opening experience. All right, so the first question I'd like to give to everyone that is currently with me is, uh, I want you to answer who is doing DevOps, and I'd like to know how many of you are employing some of these capabilities of DevOps. Okay, great. I've just pushed out that first polling question. It is one of two that we'll have during today's event. You have a few things to select from. Uh, who is doing DevOps? Source code management, continuous integration, continuous delivery, automated testing, and automated environment provisioning. So go ahead and submit your answer, and we'll take a look at the responses in a couple seconds. We'll give you guys about 10 seconds left. Also, uh, we've already gotten in some great questions from you guys. So if you, uh, if you do have a question for Logan, please uh, feel free to use that to control panel to submit your questions. We'll take a few minutes at the end and look at, uh, look at what you guys have sent in. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close this poll right now, and then we'll go ahead and share the results. Okay, looks like we've got the majority of folks are doing continuous integration, um, followed closely by d continuous delivery. Logan, um, what do you make of these, uh, these responses and how is this kind of driving what you're seeing in the marketplace? Yeah, um, and th this is uh, perfectly representative of I think where people are in the marketplace. Most people understand um, you know, that, that the fundamental starting point is source, source code management. And then the majority of people are really at this point of um, continuous integration, um, <clears throat> where they've really understood how do we take everything that we're committing to source control and tie it together so that we're getting constant feedback on whether or not our software is broken. And then you begin to tie in continuous delivery, automated testing, and automated environment provisioning. And those are the really the three, the big three things, the big three constraints that most organizations run into. Um, and, and that's evident here by you know the respondents showing that a fewer of them actually do that at the moment yeah so, okay thanks everyone Interesting. yeah thank you and i'll go ahead and hide these results and turn it back over to you logan all right thank you <clears throat> so what we really you know i brought up the devops 2.0 definition and I think the biggest thing that we have to understand is that software value streams are extremely unique. We have to be able to distinguish the key differences when we talk about lean processes um, between lean processes used in a physical manufacturing plant where we can actually see everything that we're putting together and, and on a conveyor belt and the final, final assembly. It's really easy to know that a working car, for instance, is something that we can drive off of the lot that doesn't have any defects or very few. As opposed to software manufacturing in which you're committing source 
code to source control system and you really lose visibility of it past that point. And a really big part of the DevOps movement has been to try to get to moving faster with committing, building, testing, and deploying. Um, and I really think that that is a that's a it's a good thing for organizations to begin to understand it and tackle that tackle the the continuous integration and moving faster question. But you can't just focus on that one problem. You really have to think holistically. You really have to think across the value stream. How is how are these extra builds that I'm producing on a daily basis? or even an hourly basis going to affect the downstream parts of my process. So when we don't understand, when, we, when we're asking ourselves that questions and we, those questions and we begin to start to think holistically, we're really trying to understand how do we get to this point where we're talking about value stream mapping and um, really trying to, trying to visualize and codify a process in a way that everybody comes to the table and and visualizes all of the work, not just automation, but also manual work that is, you know, accounts for time taken in the process to get from concept to cash. This value stream mapping uh, exercise is really the key uh, foundation for getting to this state of DevOps awesomeness. Okay. Um, now, why do I bring up value stream mapping as an important part of understanding? what DevOps really should be or what DevOps 2.0 really should be. Well, we still have two big challenges when we're talking about software development. As I mentioned before, the, the software factory or the software assembly is not as visual as you get with a physical manufacturing plant. So we really have to begin to understand what our, what, what are we trying to measure from a flow perspective? So if we really want to try to apply lean concepts, how do we take the concept of flow and moving fast and apply that and add that with small batch sizes so we're moving fast in small batch sizes? Um, what we really have to do is to, uh, to identify the challenge of, well, there's nothing for us to really measure when we're developing software. And so for Agile teams, um, and, and I work almost exclusively with Agile teams, we come, we've come up with this idea that Business value should be measured by work on it, which is a story or a defect. If you can get as discrete as a story or a defect in a waterfall process, that's great for trying to measure, right? Um, but we have to agree before we begin the process of improvement for this value stream idea that we're going to measure something that's very discrete and we're going to keep that constant. <clears throat> um, the other cool thing is if you if you're kind of trying to figure out well what does that really mean I don't I st even though you're calling a story or a defect uh, part of your business value I don't really under still don't understand what that means right so if you're really trying to grasp that conversation that's a that's probably a day's worth of a of a class that or a day's worth of a collaboration event that people could sit around the table and talk about and it is. Um, Highly intriguing and again very elegant to, to, to think about and, and talk through. So I would highly recommend that if you're trying to answer that question for yourself, you go and find this book by Mark Schwartz called The Art of Business Value. Um, it, it really helped to uh, enlighten the way that I think about how we're defining business value um, and how we're trying to help business value get from the idea of it to the customer faster. It's very helpful. <clears throat> the second challenge that we have is once we've identified that business value metric or the business the piece of business value that we're actually going to measure we still have this visibility and traceability problem as i mentioned when we asked the question about what are, are the capabilities that you're using right now um the the biggest problem that you have is once you've committed that source code, you lose visibility into all of the work that's been happening from an English perspective, right? So if you look at my graphic, you have on the bottom half a document. Maybe it's a story or defect. Maybe it's a requirements document that's been broken up, but we're committing code against these requirements things that we've put into our, our planning systems. and after we send them into continuous integration and a build process, 
all of those changes become binary ones and zeros. And they're no longer human readable. They're only readable by a computer. And so we have to figure out a way to provide better visibility into those ones and zeros so that we can trace everything past a commit in the DevOps machine until it gets to the end of the process where your customer is receiving value. <clears throat> Okay, now I have a very bold statement to make and I want you to stick with me here because um, it's just a bold statement, so prepare yourself. So we know that DevOps, at least I think those of us that have been practicing it for these five or six or seven years, we know that DevOps really has the potential to change the way that software is delivered and developed and how every piece, every action, every action in the value stream is, is visual. Every person in the value stream collaborates. You know, we really get to that third way of thinking where there's constant feedback back and forth in the value stream. Now, I hate to say it, but DevOps is kind of the problem in a lot of organizations. And Stick with me. I don't want that to rub anybody the wrong way. I just have to say um, it's unfortunate that just like the just like in Agile, we kind of saw, um, you know, a great process is taken and, and people do things that are kind of weird with it. I think that there's similar things happening with happening with DevOps. And so when I say it's the it's also a problem, it's really it's really core to what are we really trying to do with DevOps within our organizations? So let's kind of tackle that, uh, that hypothesis here. All right, so why do I think that DevOps is the solution, right? We looked at Gene Kim's definition at the very beginning. Um, it's really this understanding of how we can improve culture and how improving culture can hand in hand improve the way that we build our automation and our visualization around changes being made to our value stream. And that really becomes this really comes to this idea of understanding um, DevOps, not only, but not only understanding it, it comes to the point of um, really reaching and achieving DevOps awesomeness. And I feel like I need to define that before I keep going. So when I say DevOps awesomeness, when we talk about DevOps and we talk about Agile, where there's never really an ending point to the transformation that you bring your organization or yourselves through. It's a continuous process of understanding how we can always improve, learning from our mistakes, being better for ourselves and our customers. And that's what that really means. We always are improving the culture and the automation such that we're achieving DevOps awesomeness because our people that are on our teams love to work for our organizations and the customers that we have love to see our products and use our products, okay? So if you go and look, um, Puppet, with the help of the DORA DevOps Research and Assessment Organization, goes over uh, every year, they, they, they send out a survey for people to fill out um, and then they published that survey, and it's, a, it's called the State of DevOps Report. They started in 2014, I believe. Um, and last year's report was really great. Um, I think that trying to capture what the solution is, is really, if you look at the, the, the information that they've put in those four studies so far, that I count right, 14, 15, 16, 17, four studies, is um, it really does start to paint a picture of the outcome, the out, what the outcomes are for highly successful organizations. And then um, they try to tell you, give you case studies about what these companies are doing in order to improve their culture and, the, and their state of getting to um, delivered software. And so the DevOps, the, the state of DevOps report for successful people for DevOps is a solution really tells us that um, the high performers are deploying code more often with less time to fix 
problems that that code causes. All at the same time, the people that work in those organizations really like to work for those organizations because they have blameless cultures where we're not trying to find the problem as a, as a person causes it. We're trying to fix processes around um, processes around the people that can cause problems. Okay. Now, when I talk about DevOps is the problem, it's really this idea of, well, I can just go down the culture path and we'll get to DevOps awesomeness, or I can go down just the automation path and I can get to DevOps awesomeness. Okay. It's, it's not, they just fundamentally, when you're talking about improving the way a software organization does their business, it just doesn't work. Right. I, if I go down the culture path and try to make the third way, the, the best thing that we're doing, and we can sit around a campfire and sing and be happy about the way that we're doing our work. If we never implement automation and we never try to improve the way that we work from an automation perspective, we're never going to be able to deliver software as fast as our competitors. Right now, it, the other hand, if I just focus on automation and I don't focus on improving culture, um, you're never going to, and your culture is bad, you're never going to be able to bring in the really great people that are going to help you really try to improve or you bring on those continuous learning and continuous um, improvement types of processes and practices within an organization. Okay. And if you go to look at what the state of DevOps report says from last year for this part of the process, you're going to see that it says, even though over the last four years, we've seen the proliferation of automation, and we have heard these organizations report that more people are doing automation, more people are investing in uh, CI, CD, automated testing, automated test provisioning. We're not seeing the rate of high performers increase at the rate of the automation. And that's because we're trying to do not, we're trying to do culture in its isolation and we're trying to do automation in an isolated way. And so we really have to merge the two. So, Use DevOps as the way, as the platform to not only inspire automation, but also drive culture to be better at continuous improvement. <clears throat> okay. Now, I get to answer the question again, why is DevOps the problem? I think, and I touched on this when I brought up the key capabilities of DevOps, I think that one of the biggest unintended consequences of automation um, improvements that DevOps really touts is this notion of change pooling, right? We've given a lot of focus to source control and continuous integration and maybe continuous delivery in, a, in the development realm. And so our development teams are really good at taking your requirement and throwing it in source control and doing unit testing and creating some sort of acceptance test <clears throat> um, and getting it on a server for them to test and say, hey, hey, uh, stakeholder, we're done with this. Um, and that that's really great in small teams and small organizations where the path to getting something into production is uh, very quick and it's very easy. Um, and where this change pooling problem might not occur, you might be delivering one story at a time or one defect at a time or even one commit at a time, which is a really awesome. You know, if you're doing that, that's great for you. But what I find is, you know, when we talk about DevOps not being for the unicorns, DevOps not just being for the big four, we really have to focus on what differentiates <clears throat> that 99% of companies from the big four. And it's that it's a, it's just a fundamental lack of understanding of what DevOps can really do for you and that you can't just have source control and continuous integration and continuous delivery because those things just just, uh, just cause the problems to manifest themselves quicker. And so that's why I bring up this change pooling idea. And, and it's probably the biggest impediment to awesomeness because even though our development teams can really crank out a lot of good things from their development perspective, in big organizations, you still have a testing process to go through. And you still have um, change management process to adhere to. And you still have uh, um, you still have a release management process to go to. 
and you still have an audit process that you have to follow. And there's these really, you know, and, and we're change pooling these things and we're only doing monthly or quarterly releases and all those, those three things to the testing and the change management <clears throat> and the auditing all have to happen on these big chunks of work. And when we find a problem, it's super expensive to go fix them because the development team hasn't worked on them in weeks time. So I'd really like to go out to the audience again and understand for those of you that are watching and hanging out with me today, how often do you release your software? All right, I'm gonna go ahead and launch that poll right now. It should be up on your screen. How often do you release software? So you could select a one of five every day or more often, every week, once a month, once a quarter, or once a year. Go ahead and submit your response. And uh, as I said before, if you've got a question for Logan, any time during this presentation, just use that control panel and get your questions in. We've gotten a ton of really good questions in so far. So I'm looking forward to the question and answer period. Okay, we'll give you guys about five seconds more. We've gotten about 70% of voted, folks who have voted, so that's, <laughs> that's really good. So great, we'll go ahead and close it out now and I'll share the results. Okay, sharing the results. How often do you release software? It looks like once a month is the big winner here, followed by once a quarter. Logan, um, what do you think of that cadence? Do you think that's too too often, not often enough? What do you think? Huh, well, um, <laughs> clearly, you know, I think obviously the the, the when, um, when we talk about what DevOps means in the ideal state, it's really trying to get to every day or every change, right? We want to really want to get there, but the problem is a lot of organizations, as I mentioned, the 99%, not the unicorns, really don't have, um, <clears throat> aren't empowered or aren't enabled enough to be able to support that model. And so, you know, what I think is important for people that are starting to do Agile and DevOps together is getting into a, a cadence that really works for your team and then trying to improve it, right? If we're always talking about continuous improvement, we're always talking about how do we get to that point where we can do single batch change or one commit goes to production, like Facebook and like Google. Okay, great. I'm gonna go ahead and hide this and let you get back to your presentation now. Thank you, Charlene. And thanks everyone for answering that question. I really appreciate it. Now, um, as I continue, uh, the, the biggest thing, like I said, is really this problem of change pooling, right? So I have this really cute cartoon that was created by uh, some of my colleagues at CollabNet, and so that this that's their shout out for this presentation. Um, they made it into the presentation for us. So, you know, if you're just trying to visualize what I actually mean by the change pooling problem, imagine that you're a parent sitting outside watching a bunch of kids playing around the pool, right? These kids represent individual commits that are going into source control, right? So kids are commits, pool is source control, we start to make changes in source control and our build system begins to, and these kids are perfectly okay, they're just going under the water for just a few seconds. Um, they're starting to, to make changes and your build system is starting to generate artifacts and we know when we are, um, we're trying to figure out which kid or which change do we pick to promote in order to get to that place where we can say we're done with our work or we get to that place where we're going to release our code to our customers, right? And so even though we might pick this person, this kid, this commit, or this artifact to be the artifact that we're going to promote, we still only see that one, um, that one change, right? There's no indication to us in the way that things currently work or are thought out as to all four of those commits that jumped into the pool and what they are and what they represent. We only see the one that's at the head, one that's at the top, the one that is, um, is uh, very apparent from using our build system that we've promoted. So this is a really good segue into, you know, <clears throat> I mentioned defining the difference between DevOps and DevOps 2.0 and there's not really a big difference other than to say, DevOps 2.0 is really for us to try to um, 
is really for us to try to get back to thinking more holistically about what we're doing from concept to cash, right? But when I talk about value stream, um, value streams, there is a, there is something coming that we've started to, you know, talk about with customers and <clears throat> analysts, and it's this notion of uh, of being able to manage a value stream, and think of a value stream as something that right we're talking about concept to cash. We're not just talking about committing code and getting it to our customer. We're thinking holistically, right? And so when we think about value stream and we have to think about value stream management, we need to be able to have platforms that can support that measurement and identifying all the work that's going through and how fast are we doing it and what are the riskiness, what's the riskiness of deployments and how do we improve the audit and compliance reports that we have to provide to our, to our leadership or our, or our auditors. <clears throat> um, so we come up with these four things that a value stream management platform has to do. Okay. So I'm going to deep dive into these four capabilities real quick and give you kind of a, a bird's eye view into what that might look like. So when we talk about what visibility and traceability mean to an organization, do you really know what work you're doing? So if you're practicing agile, this might make a little more sense. And I apologize to the folks that aren't, it might not, but think of it when you're looking at this board as these cards are, big pieces of work, big ideas that we're trying to achieve for our organization and for our customers. And we really just want to know where are they in the process, right? And so with a Kanban board, I can very easily tell where my work is in any one of these, any one of these statuses or phases that we've, we've created. Okay. <clears throat> now <clears throat> this helps me from a planning perspective when I'm looking at software. When I want to start to talk about a delivery perspective, when I'm looking at software, the question comes up, okay, well, a lot of customers start to ask, okay, well, we've talked about all of this value stream management stuff. How do I know how much of my features I've completed? And how do I know what parts of the process my feature is in? And then it stories, what parts of the process are they in? And it's just a, you know, being able to provide the visibility and traceability by feature so that you can see how much of a how much of the feature is completed is is really a way for uh, our our customers and those of you out there who are trying to do value stream management. <clears throat> it's really a way for you to get that visibility so that you can have more confidence in the process past commit. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> I want to be able to view this slide. This I want to be able to. I want to be able to have visibility by package or by artifact. So are you able to tie every single work item, story or defect, to back to a specific artifact that gets deployed or promoted into any environment? And then are you able to provide release notes from that particular activity that detail all of the work items, all of the changes, and the versioned artifact that got deployed? That, that, you know, we have to be able to provide that as a value stream management. I, I need that from a value stream management package uh, platform. <clears throat> and then we're talking about metrics and measures. So how, how fast are we moving through the process? What are the lead times that we're seeing? How efficient is our process? Where are our bottlenecks? We have to be able to understand these sorts of things to really get lean thinking back into software development. <clears throat> and then I need to know what is the risk framework or the risk profile of specific releases so that I can gain confidence in knowing that we followed the proper steps with big change pools to be able to say, okay, we know we've got, 100% coverage with our tests so that we can do deployments or if you're willing to accept the risk of 50% coverage because you 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 tested the most comprehensive or complicated parts of your application that constantly break you 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 need to get that out of a value stream management platform okay now back to uh, the notion of a value stream and thinking about a value stream mapping process what that value stream mapping process really helps you do it not only helps you identify all of the automation that you're currently doing 
and you can talk about the automation that you want to implement, right? It, it also helps you codify the manual steps of the process that happen because those are the ones that steal time from you being able to get a smaller batch size or stealing time from you getting from commit to production. <clears throat> and so a value stream management platform has to provide comprehensive workflow orchestration. I have to be able to tie all of these activities together, whether they're automated or manual, and I have to be able to have a checklist on whether or not we've done them the right way. <clears throat> and then finally, probably the, the thing that uh, a lot of our customers, at least in the last year, have really, really complimented, um, have complimented us on thinking about is, is this notion of real-time auditing compliance. So many of you, you answered, we're releasing every month, a lot more of you, or a lot, you know, a bigger group of you, if we said monthly and quarterly, um, you answered that way. If you were to go and ask the people that are in your audit division how long it takes them to audit <clears throat> any particular release that they're working on, you know, and they tell you a week, a month, it's so hard. I have to, I have this huge Excel spreadsheet that I have to look through. I don't ever know if it's exactly right. Um, <clears throat> I have to update it every time we do a release. And it's, it's just time consuming, it's really hard. Well, what we wanna be able to do, and if I can tie together all of the activities in the work stream, whether they're manual or automated, <clears throat> I can begin to capture in smaller increments whether or not we're actually following our compliance process. Instead of trying to capture compliance activities for our auditors on month one or day 30 of our release process or day 60 of our release process, I'm capturing it after we promote to our testing environment. So I'm, I'm, I'm slimming the window down of when we are capturing these things so that <clears throat> one person doesn't have to take on all the risk of, uh, of trying to deliver, or yes, trying to deliver this audit report that covers whether or not we're following the things we should be. <clears throat> so, where do we go next? We talk about the benefits of VSM, okay? So, we really need to be able to get to a point where we understand the level of value to the business, and this is the level of value of the software that we're producing. It's the level of value of the processes that we use to, to deploy that software or get that software to our end users. Um, we understand the impact DevOps has on our operations teams. Is it really improving their lives? You know, the, the, the biggest question I'm asking is if change pooling is the biggest problem and they have to deploy hundreds of changes at a time, are we really trying to improve the things that um, improve the way that they work? <clears throat> Greater visibility into downstream operations, making sure that we're not missing things as we deploy, making teams more efficient, releasing quicker, and taking advantage of other opportunities that might come up because we know where we can invest our money or our time or our resources. So I'd like to very quickly share a couple of customer stories of, of how value stream management <clears throat> has helped them. And so we have a large athletic retailer that's an online e-commerce platform, and they have a very advanced DevOps practice. And with value stream management capabilities built into their process, they are, they are reporting improved visibility in their DevOps machine. They can accomplish tool rationalization and standardization, which means they are um, able to prove that a specific tool or set of tools can help them achieve a goal. They can also prove that different point solutions that purport to help you do one thing really well are actually good for the process instead of standardizing us on a whole tool on a you know on a vendor that has a, a tool set that provides all pieces of the process. And they use data-driven decision making to help them come to all of these realizations and, and improve their outcomes. Then we have a large insurance company that um, is very traditional, very risk averse, 
started with zero automation. So we did their value stream map. It had nothing but manual activities on it. And they worked to a point where they were able to get to source control and they were able to get to continuous integration so that they could begin to capture these metrics to improve their process. <clears throat> and then over the course of time, they've been able to use these lean metrics for flow to show that they are actually reducing cycle times on their on their features or their big ideas in when they start and when they get delivered. We have a railway company that's very traditional. Railway companies are regulated by the government, the federal government, um, and they started with some automation. And the biggest thing that they really, really enjoy from value stream management is this idea of a single pane of glass. So when you think about all of these point solutions that sit around when you're talking about a value stream, they don't all share the same data and there's not a very good way to see their data. And value stream management really gives you a way to try to um, correlate the data in a way that makes sense to tell us how we are and so that we can use that data to make better decisions about um, improvement and improving our outcomes. And then finally, a very traditional global firm with pockets of good practices. They've begun to, uh, this is a global staffing firm, they've begun to use all of those capabilities to really just improve their current process in parts of the organization that don't have good practices and to also prove that their ongoing um, digital transformation is actually valuable to the business. All right, now, I think if you're, you know, you're on the call and you're still kind of wondering, uh, how is value stream management really important to me in my job role, right? If you're really trying to, if you're really trying to understand what are the, what can I employ as, uh, as part of my job role or what would I expect as part of my job role if I employ value stream management? So the first one I'll go to is from the top, we talk about benefits for the executive. It's a new and higher level of visibility. It's insights to make incremental investments and it's greater confidence in team delivery. I think the biggest one and the most important one in that list is the insights to make incremental investments. So <clears throat> the, the coolest thing that I've heard people give feedback on by stream management is instead of organizations trying to figure out really big bang and very expensive and we don't know what it's going to cost, what the return on investment is in the future, trying to figure out what tools and what practices we should employ. The value stream management idea is let's make, let's map the value stream and let's pick an activity and let's improve it and see how that improves the whole process. And then let's pick another one and improve it and let's see how that does the whole process. So we're making inc incremental small investment of doing our work better as opposed to trying to figure out big things. And we end up getting more value out of that. <clears throat> How does this benefit a product owner, a business stakeholder, someone who's responsible for understanding what a customer wants from our business and how, and, 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 and getting developers or getting a development team to understand what that is. They get a better level of visibility into what the team is working on. They know where their business value is at all times and they can plan with confidence. So if my team is, is delivering, <clears throat> on a certain cadence and certain stories and certain features, we can expect how long it's gonna take them to do their work. We have greater confidence in telling our leadership and our customers when they can expect to get value out of our software. Then for the quality assurance manager, I think that the two biggest things that we constantly hear from testers in quality assurance management is they don't really ever have confidence that they are testing for the right things, or that they actually know what, what, is, what it is that they're testing. And with the value stream management platform, they get the ability to understand exactly which stories and defects and work items are available to them to test, so there's no confusion. Then we have, um, that, that notion comes back of incremental investment. I think one of the biggest, one of the, one of the fundamental things that has made the big four very successful is understanding how to automate more testing and do it further left in the process. 
Um, the DevOps handbook concurs. The DevOps thought leaders concur. I think a lot of um, a lot of a lot of people would concur that if we can figure out how to do more testing in an automated fashion to provide value to our business, it would really help us in making sure that we're not giving our customers bad code or bad product. And um, so we get back to that incremental investment. The testing team can figure out what's my next investment, what's most valuable to the process, as opposed to, you know, um, trying to, again, big bang changes. Let's go get this tool and use it to test everything. Let's just make small improvements and figure out what's best for this part of the process. All right, and then um, for the final, uh, the final role, what are, what are our benefits to our compliance team or our audit officers or audit team? Um, it's this notion of, as I mentioned before, it's the notion of shifting compliance left so that we're doing it in smaller batches so that they're more effective. Our compliance team knows that they can go to a change management meeting and if they see a report that says we've done A through Z on our product, we can release it. Maybe you can get rid of that big change management meeting. I know organizations that have CABs, <clears throat> change control boards that meet on a daily basis for hour, an hour or two at a time. What if we could get rid of that part of the process so that the people that are on the meeting can do more valuable things for their business? And so that you know with confidence, 100% that you've done all of the work that's required to release something. So that if you ever do get audited, your auditor gives you the thumbs up and says, this looks great. You've, you've captured where parts of the process aren't good. You've captured where parts of the process are good and so forth and so on. And so with all that being said, I'm making my, my summary and my conclusion here. <clears throat> um, I hope that as we've walked through the understanding of DevOps, it's that we really have to get back to the notion of holistic thinking, systems thinking, applying whole concepts, applying thought across a value stream to improve things and not just improving development, not just improving tests, not just improving operations, not just improving planning. We have to think together as one big team with one big goal to make more money or have, you know, complete the mission or have success. <clears throat> Those are the real things we need to focus on. And value stream management and value stream management platforms really give you the data and insights to be able to support making good decisions in a value stream mentality in DevOps 2.0. And so with that, um, Charlene, I am ready for any questions that our crowd might have. Awesome. Well, we have gotten a ton of questions. They've just been burning up the lines here. So I'm just going to dive right into them. And uh, actually, before I do, I want to let you guys know there's no way we're going to be able to get through all of these questions today. But please know that Logan is going to be getting a copy of everybody's questions. So I'm sure he or somebody else at CollabNet will be more than happy to follow up with you after the event if we don't get to your question during the webinar. Okay, so here's the first one. Um, what could be organ and organ? Sorry, what could be organizational level metrics for projects that have adopted DevOps? Yeah, good question. Um, so the big four that they talk about in the DevOps handbook are mean time to repair or recover, um, cycle time, lead time of fixing defects, and the last one is escaping me. Um, but th those four are typically the ones to start with and they're in the DevOps handbook gives you very good insight into how to capture them and what to do with the with the results that you've captured in addition to those four we recommend two things we recommend getting back to um, lean metrics so how much work are we trying to do at once and how fast are we moving that work through the value stream it's a mixture of some of the four that the DevOps handbook talks about from a, a lead time cycle time perspective, plus batch size. And then, uh, and then finally, understanding a risk profile of what you're actually releasing. 
so that you have a very, you know, a multi-dimensional view of, um, of, of where you currently are. And um, obviously from a continuous improvement perspective, what you can improve and then just being confident in your delivery. All right, great. Next question, is DevOps 2.0 closely related to BizOps? Um, I think, yeah, I think, you know, I'm, I, I try not, I, I know that I'm hitting on a buzzword um, and I, I really, I tried, tried not to, but I think, um, I think yes, BizOps is uh, probably very important. If I'm talking about DevOps 2.0, right, you're, when you talk about BizOps, you're talking about how do I include the business in this thing called DevOps? And DevOps, the, the definition of DevOps 2.0 that I gave you is really, yes, the same thing, but I'd like for us to continue to, to explore how do we widen the fold so that more people from more roles, customer, you know, whatever it is, more, we get more feedback to improve the way that we work in the product. All right. Great. Now, this next question is one actually that I've, I've heard quite a bit, and so I'm really interested in hearing your answer to it. How does ops actually get involved in DevOps? Most discussions on DevOps only seem to speak to, de to developers or to the dev part of DevOps. Right. Um, yeah, I, that's a very good question. Um, you know, we work with organizations all the time where the, the relationship between the dev and the ops team is not very good. Um, it really takes, how, how does the ops organization get involved? It's really gonna take, um, especially if you're from an organization where that culture is not very good and where there's been problems in the past, it's gonna take two leaders or the leaders who are responsible for dev and ops um, to come together and figure out what, what can our shared goals be? Right. Um, how do we make the developers feel the pain that the operations team has when the operation team has to deploy their stuff? And how do we make the operations team feel the pain that the development team has when the development team is trying to develop? And when we share pain and we share a common goal, we can really begin to work together. Now, getting into that conversation is really, I think, um, if you don't have a leader who's willing to to jump in and, and start to lead that conversation, I think it's, you know, if you work in an organization where it's perfectly fine for you to, for the ops team or a group, a small group of ops people to go talk to a small group of dev people and figure out together what you're going to do off the books to improve the parts of the process that are currently bad. You know, I think we've lost a lot of, uh, I think we've lost a lot of the meaning of the word leadership. Um, when I talk about DevOps in conferences and when I talk about DevOps to people, I talk about it being both a top down and a bottom up approach where people from all parts of the organization have to, have to take initiative. They have to lead. It's a verb. It means, it means anybody can do it. Um, and it's really, you know, you, you, if you see a gap in a process, taking, making an effort to try to improve it, not in a way that's going to get you fired, but in a way that helps improve everybody's lives such that a leader might see it and, you know, decide to take ownership of how do we spread this out through the organization. So all of our ops people are included in the things that are, are good improvements for the way that we work. All right. Great. Um, next question, uh, and this one is a little long, so bear with me. We have a change management process that requires us to submit a change request for approval. The board meets weekly on a Wednesday, and the request must be submitted by the prior Monday. Do other organizations not have this level of change management? I would say a, a large majority of organizations have that type of change management. Um, especially, you know, organizations that have, I'd say organizations that have more than a thousand employees have that kind of change management. Um, I say a thousand employees, I mean, in the tech, in, in the technical organization, just because there's so much going on. Um, and 
you know, this question wasn't asked as part of that. And that was a good question, but ultimately that comes from a level of distrust in culture that is an outcome of past events that have happened that have burned the organization and they have to enforce that change management process to make sure that people aren't making, you know, changes they're not supposed to. Um, but we see that happen all the time and it's still going on. Okay. All right. Great. We're about five minutes to the top of the hour. I think we have time for one or two more questions. This next question is also another long one. So again, bear with me. Um, starts with a, uh, actually a, um, a compliment to you. It says great thought leadership. Thanks. And the question is building off of what was on what was mentioned during slide 14. I don't know if you want to turn to that one. I agree that simultaneous cultural and automation change is the greatest challenge. With that in mind, what are the impediments for these happening at the same time within an organization, which may need to be focused upon regardless of regardless of if it's agile or DevOps or agile at scale or DevOps 2.0 or whatever else is next. Right. Uh, thanks for the compliment. Awesome <laughs> question. Um, yeah, you know, the biggest impediment is really trying to, you know, picking up phrases. It's trying to boil the ocean at once. It's trying to eat the elephant at once. There's just no, there's no possible way that you can, ex um, that you can do all of the culture and all the automation at once. And so the biggest impediment is if either you as a team expect getting to 100%, getting to DevOps awesome in a week or an unreasonable time frame, and your leadership or vice versa, your leadership not really understanding what it takes to get to this part, this DevOps awesomeness. You know, when you're really trying to do DevOps, when you're really trying, let's just call it process improvement. When you're really just trying to do process improvement, DevOps, DevOps 2.0, Agile, Agile at scale, you have to manage expectations in a way that people, individual contributors can meet those expectations and management knows what to expect and can support you. And I think, uh, I wish I had it in this presentation. It brings back a very vivid in, uh, memory from DevOps Days Philadelphia this past year. Nicole Forsgren shared a slide that, that showed when an organization decides to do this digital transformation or whatever we're going to call it, DevOps Agile thing, um, there's, there's the, the J curve where you start to, to practice the culture and you start to practice the automation, but before anything gets better, you get to the dip in the J and things get worse before they get better. But it's in those worst things or it's in those hard things that you learn the best lessons. And so if you can get to a point where you can teach people what to expect in that really hard part of a transformation, I think that's how you figure out how to remove those impediments. And it's really don't bite, don't bite off more than you can chew. You know, don't tell a, a leader that you're going to get from quarterly releases to daily releases in, in a quarter. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you have to be able to manage that expectation and not just try to, um, not try to boil the issue. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, they say the best DevOps implementations are those that are constantly evolving. So they're mm -hmm. continuing DevOps and uh, so there's never an end point with DevOps. That's right. All right. So I think uh, we're about two minutes at the top of the hour. So that's pretty much all the time that we have for the questions. Um, but I do want to thank everybody who did submit a question and um, remember that uh, Logan is getting all of these questions. Uh, so I'm sure that he or somebody else at CollabNet will be more than happy to, fo uh, to follow up with you guys uh, after the event and get your question answered. And also remember that today's event has been recorded. So uh, post event, you will receive an email with a link to the webinar on demand. So please, uh, uh, feel free to check it out again at your leisure. Uh, it will also be included on the DevOps.com website. Also be sure to check the DevOps.com website for upcoming webinars that we have uh, scheduled. We've got a ton of really good ones. 
Um, but uh, this one was an outstanding webinar. Thank you, Logan, so much for giving us such an insightful presentation. It's uh, it's very um, it's always very uh, interesting to hear uh, the opinions and always really fascinating to see how many people uh, sometimes disagree with the opinion. So um, thank you again for that, uh, for that insightfulness. And uh, I would like to thank the audience for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon and I'm signing off. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs>